The Heart on a Hand's Legs, Baba Yaga. This is the theme of the Russian evil in the Mussorgsky music. It's a remarkable work. And went into the epic canvas. I call it nothing but this anymore, since it's really an epic canvas. The pictures at an exhibition by Mosuski, uh, it is uh, the unblemished Slavic nature of the great Russian man is coming to life. This is the second piece dedicated to the evil spirit. It is interesting to see and compare it to the first piece, the Gnome. By now, uh, we know that the gnome is nothing but a transformed historical development of the myth, of the European myth about gnomes, which has re refracted in the Russian consciousness into the evil spirits. Uh, it was very interesting transformation, how from one consciousness, one culture, it goes through another consciousness, through another culture, and becoming a totally different phenomenon. So, if we go back and uh, trying to remember I will try to remember the gnome sounded when it was sounded to the V appearance. The scary figure of Russian consciousness through the goggle creature, uh, literature, literature hero. I'd like to say here that the musical intonation of composers uh, whole life, his world outlook are present in him at all times. This is very, very important to know. I was fortunate to have known some real great composers in my lifetime. And I know a little bit from the outside point of view, because I was too young to really understand anything and to appreciate. But from my personal experience and conversations with uh, great composers, I know how a certain musical intonations live in a person and the person lives with them in their whole life. When they appear, the composers can really um, say, uh, was it consciously, subconsciously, when it appeared. Uh, that is whether uh, they were born with these intonations or they acquired them. There are the questions which scientists are the ones to answer. Probably not so soon, because this is not something of first importance and has nothing to do with the health issues occupying medical scientists' minds. Nevertheless, it is absolutely obvious to me, and you can believe my empirical experience, that the composer is practically born with music that later ripens with him within his organism. The same as our the same way like our body ripens when we go through our childhood, puberty, teenage years, then youth, then we mature, accumulating and comprehending our life experience. And this is then when the real creation of art begins. But certain motives which are associated with negativity, bad things or positive, love, kind of good things, uh, they live in shape of melody and sometimes in shape of just musical intervals or chords. And so it is easy to trace this development of the gnome. What is the V appearance? It is a theme of evil which Modest Petrovich felt inside. Yes, it is. It is a theme of evil. And he felt it inside as long as he could remember himself, I'm sure. It is easy to trace from the fragments of his early and unfortunately unfinished work, Opera the Fair at Sarachinsky, where a famous overture or symphonic poem, symphonic piece, you can just call it a fragment, Night of the Bold Mountains, Night on the Bear Mountain, where all the evil creatures are flocking together. So how do the evil spirits appear? First, they are flying. I'll try to remember. Um, first, the vi only violence playing, um, portraying the, 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 the flying in the flying in the, the dangerous forces in the air. Violence playing there. Moving away. Coming closer or moving away. There will be crescendo diminuendo. Flight. The flight of evil spirit. The good spirit doesn't fly on chromatic harmonies. 
and so on. It is connected with our perception of this world. Uh, I'm trying not to be uh, loquacious here, because all of this is so interesting, but uh, we will devote a separate record cycle to it, um, to speak about all these uh, scientific matters and psychological matters, how the associations come to life, why they do, and how all this is connecting with our bodies, our physiology, our vision, touch, taste, hearing, with all our existence on our planet. All has its own logical explanation, and it's, written, it's all very rational. It is an exceedingly interesting process. So, why do the chromatic passages call the feeling of discomfort, connection to the evil spirit, etc., etc.? This is something unpleasant. Night on the Bald Mountain. It started with pennies. The witches are flying on the brooms. And then... And the all evil spirits appearing in no other way or motive but the same notes or the musical intervals and Yeah, the same intervals which transformed V appearing later. That's the beginning of the um, uh, Night on the Bald Mountain. This is a very characteristic musical sketch that gives us an image of the evil. Namely, uh, by using glissando from one tone to another, because here again we have uh, speaking of associations, crawling association with the reptile. And what is a reptile? Uh, not a reptile in the sense of a, a biblical description, but later on, the association of reptile with something that has neither arms nor legs, crawls on its belly, and therefore associated with crawling chromatic harmonies, therefore causing our dislike, because we are afraid of this. It has an easy and simple physiological explanation, having something to do with our physiology. Dislike for something that has neither arms nor legs. And it's significantly, significantly different from ours. And we associate it with something that crawls on its belly, the next association being growl. Um, it's growl. In short, um, who am I to explain it to you, my dear audience, my dear spectators, since you all know it yourself very well and can explore it for yourself, as it's such a fun research to trace our musical and physiological association. Uh, it, is really, it is really funny, it is really joyful research. In the appearance of the major evil spirits and the night on the bald mountains, Mosuski combined those very same gnome, Gnome idea that came later on, musical intervals and notes, into exactly the same one. That is to say, this is one of the evil themes that lived in his soul. Absolutely obvious that uh, he was born with this theme, and here he is giving it to us. We have it in the Gnome, only in a different essence. If they are a well, night on the Bald Mountain, no, well, which is all kinds of spirits were flocking together, then in Gnome Mosuski present us with the evil, it's distal form, in its distal form, by using the same tones, not mixing them. Uh, because he wanted to depict a posture to us, and naturally he got this association with V, uh, because posture, gnome, dwarf, posture, the other word, goggle, Russian consciousness, we just don't have any other figure. With which we uh, can associate this heavily metallic multi-southern ton posture. 
in all our literature, in all our epos, in all the Russian culture, in all the the, the horrific world you know, of um, the literature figure and epos, only V is moving like this, or no one else. That's why, time and time again, I'm perfectly confident that is the appearance of V that we see in the central part of the Gnome. So, Forgive me for getting distracted, but I have to interrupt myself to talk about this seemingly distant subjects, because we have to understand the way of thought, the way of mind and the process of the composition and the sense of how it all comes to life. Since for some people uh, it is a perfect mystery, for some people it's really a complete mystery how is that. Where does it come, where does it all come from? Uh, well, it is done. Uh, consciously, how it is done, consciously or subconsciously, where do all these themes, motives, associations come from, etc., etc., etc. Okay, that's how we are born with them. I am absolutely confident. Apparently, these motives are uh, inherited genetically because there is no way we can get them from outside to digest, to digest them. As they say, uh, we deeply absorb something uh, to digest, yeah, uh, when we have something from outside and transform them. Usually the material that a composer gets from the outside is easy to spot. It's usually connected with his perception of nature. We can remind ourselves of Rachmanin, of Tchaikovsky, uh, descriptive uh, picturesque things, and we can see a grown person who has already seen musical images, landscapes, through the prism of his inner vision. But the basic themes like good and evil, the harmony and good spirit, and the good feeling and light, is already within with us, genetically. And in fact, any person who gets to uh, compose uh, will take the basis. Uh, he will take you know, one or another perception out of his person, get it crystallized, filtered, and he will write the music. And everyone will do it differently. And everyone will be pretty um, persuasive, because it has to do with our physics, our genetics, our anatomy, our structure, with using Gogol's words, all our composition. And I love using this word, this Google, uh, Google used, the, our composition. But if the gnome, if in the gnome the evil is connected with a fairy tale, a mythological character, because this is picture about the gnome, uh, that's why it's evoked mythology. But the Yaga, is a totally different uh, the, the depiction of evil. Yaga evoked completely different association in Moses's soul. That has nothing to do with the myth, but with his inner, deep, physiological perception and understanding of the evil. In our time of the Internet, links and various possibilities to obtain the information, you can easily trace the etymology of Yaga within half an hour and get the comprehensive information. But the main uh, and defining feature of Yaga's image is nevertheless the ancient Slavic roots as an epitome of the evil and death. She is the goddess of death. According to one of the multiple versions which I am inclined to, uh, because all people have these anthropomorphic gods, and for some reason, as a rule of female species, uh, like Aztecs, Indians, Slavs, such as Baba, that symbolized death and destruction of life, was different national characteristic. In the very deep roots of Russian consciousness, Yaga is something connected with the deep cynicism. If you remember, she fries little children, divorces little children. All this is very frightening. If we can abstract ourselves from the defensive reaction that we have <laughs> supplied to us by the Soviet rule, cutting us off from the roots, of our rich culture, because you all know perfectly well that the main goal of the communists were to create a new person. That meant cutting him, uh, cutting him off from all cultural roots, not only cultural roots, but actually to make him think flat and be manipulated. But therefore, first of all, no culture. Just cut off cultural roots and then you will have uh, a, a robot, uh, which is very, which very easy to program and manipulate and conduct. We were cut off the cultural roots in every way, 
in every way possible, and they continue to do so. Sometimes consciously nowadays, not so much consciously as unconsciously. It happens to the unfortunate Russian people by inertia. Our consciousness constantly getting cut and cut and cut like a cob of the cabbage before it's put in soup or borscht. <laughs> Wherever it's put into Duna, my Ben Shab. Well, anyway, it's a cultural perception, our deep root understanding of belonging to our history and our nationalist history. Um, roots is completely cut off to the point where we turn into such naked, emasculated corpse. And so. At this time, the goal of every cultural Russian person is to restore his identity, try to, to take roots, which is very, very difficult to do. Of course, try to get everything back using the information. This, to tell you the truth, is a work of a lifetime, to become a person again. Because all of us, by the design of Soviet incubator, cease to be a person. Actually, this is the way it is. And so, what is... What is uh, our Baba Yaga? Baba Yaga is what, uh, since the 30s of Soviet rule, was pro propagandizing, utilizing the quality work of good actors. Uh, some silly, stupid thing, neither comical nor non-comical. For generations had grown up since on, these new images, 60 years were being attacked into bed by good night little ones, where our root deep knowledge of folklore has transformed into something um, unintelligible, kitsch, cheap, stupid and dull, and nobody cares about. This is what our consciousness is. The product of Soviet culture, of so-called Soviet culture. But Musiski didn't have this. Yaga could only evoke in Wososki the real association, which is what uh, this frightful goddess of death, goddess of cynicism, god, goddess of all that hits you below the belt, was supposed to evoke. What brought it to life uh, was triggered. It was quite innocent picture by Gartman. Was a, just a visit, it was uh, just a little picture with a cool, cool clock. Now you can see how naive it is to assume that Gartman brought our, uh, brought, uh, really brought out uh, something in Mussorgsky by the images in his sketches. Of course not. This is exceedingly naive and silly. But unfortunately, because of this uh, thoughtless attitude, because our roots are cut off, because we are people without roots, because we are corpse cut down to the core in the sense of culture. We let all of our musical heritage to get derailed. All our culture, all our deep feelings, we are carriers of such a homeless culture. This is not just sad, this is just... That's a real tragedy. This, this is a Russian tragedy, a Russian apocalypse. Our entire journey into the pictures was a journey of a person not yet damaged in his mind, in his heart, in his spirit, plus not yet damaged by superficial Western influences, which is, in the Russian case were borrowed instead of absorbed. Let's see Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff appropriate the Western techniques. They appropriated the, just, just the techniques pretty successfully. In Rachmaninoff's case, it's mostly piano technique. Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff are definitely related like father and son. Yeah, they, they are totally different, they, they are westernized Russian, they are actually like foreigners. Yes, I said that they are like, uh, like father and son, and uh, their composing techniques are is very similar, as well as the way they think, but they can't even be called Russian. They are not Russian composers. No, they are fine Russian people, fine Russian artists who grew up exclusively on the fundamental Western culture, taking it through the prism of their Russian consciousness at the time they lived. Tchaikovsky is uh, kind of an 18th century with the likeness of a master, of a third lord. In Rachmaninoff we see a master gentleman uh, who has already stepped into the 20th century, uh, the likes of a passenger from Titanic. But they're not real Russians. 
Their Russians mutated on European values, European foundation, European technique, European way of thinking, technology, which uh, has become their toolkit and mindset. That is, they were foreigners, uh, all out all, which is Russian, not Europeanized, Westernized Russian. I think uh, they would be much surprised to hear such a description from me, as probably many Russian people uh, in our days. But it is so, uh, regardless, we can trace it now in historical retrospective. Not without reason, Rachmaninoff became such an integrated American. Tchaikovsky was leaning to the Germans and basically uh, is a Russian variant of Schumann, uh, whom he loved dearly under the influence of Beethoven orchestra, orchestra work and technique. But uh, Mussorgsky is totally different. He is from there. From that time where Baba Yaga was what she really was. The epitome of death and violence. He is a real native Russian, not touched by Western culture. And it's not surprising that there is a, a wall of partition in our minds between Tchaikovsky, who thought that Mussorgsky is just a freak, using the modern word, or Rachmaninoff, who doesn't even want to talk about him. For them, uh, he is alien uh, from another planet. They are so much Europeans in their suits, in their, with their cigars. Well, Modest Petrovich is living in another planet that neither Tchaikovsky nor Rachmaninoff don't know about and don't want to know. That is such a watershed moment. And like I said before, we have only three figures in Russian music history who, a real Russian, who lean to each other, one chain. The Mussorgsky who gave us the beginnings, Shostakovich who developed it in our time, uh, strangely and sickly, and Stravinsky uh, who seemed to be looking at the Russian root deep culture that goes back to the Slavic tribes down from the cosmic space who gave us, like a scientist, which he gave us in Rite of Spring, the firebird, the psalm-like, absolutely breathtaking images with the Slavic connection. All the barbarism of those like, but uh, uh, looking from the space distance. How they did a technical sense of view is another story. It's a mystery, of course. The harmonies are quite simple. Sometimes there are only one or two sounds, and uh, all of a sudden the whole cosmos is opening before us. We are also going to touch on this issue because we have such a composer as Liszt, who is uh, uh, very loquacious. It's not enough. He is constantly talking away in his music, but he is also repeating himself one, two, three, four, five, ten times. He is like a publicist. He wants us to digest his every musical thought, every philosophical thought, and he hammers away at it. But it's totally unbearable at times. And Anyway, he doesn't reach the goal he so, so very much desires, exactly because of his talkativeness. He doesn't reach the heights where, with one stroke, one jewel, we can see the whole cosmos in this one gem. Like in Kaleidoscope, that it turns by a magic hand, and we see a different world, a different galaxy. Everything is different. This is surely a mystery. Naturally, you can decode all this using myriads of chain association and giving scientific explanation, but you will spend your whole life on this. Well, of course, it's very interesting, never-ending world for music critics and researchers of the human uh, psychology and the musical relations. But let's go back to Baba Yaga. So wildness, beastliness, not the mythological, but real. Everything Modest Petrovich saw and heard in his lifetime, as Russian character goes, he didn't know any other. He didn't go anywhere else outside his very limited geographic location where he existed. All this was his blood, was his blood chemistry. And his mind was uncommonly singular. Again, again and again, we compare minds. There is a dramatic difference between the minds of Mosovsky, Shostakovich and Stravinsky. There are gigantic minds. 
these are gigantic mines. And on the one hand, quite weak, Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, Rimsky, Korsko, well, this one is even one flight down, roughly speaking. Let's see, yeah, flight down, one, so one step down, uh, metaphysically. In those composers we can see a big deal of uh, sensuousness, keen perception of the world based on their own personalities, on their own emotion. They look the world through their egos. But if we take out all the emotions from the music of, let's say, Tchaikovsky or Rachmaninoff, Rachmaninoff is also a remarkable painter, yeah? Uh, which is artwork, poetry, sensuousness in both of their music. If we take out all that, uh, the naked emotion, there will be nothing left, because there is not a great deal of intellectual grain there. By the way, we can also continue our thought and see lots of flaws in Tchaikovsky musical work, like uh, the way he connects one musical thought with another, there is no flexibility there, and we can literally see the seams like he sews several materials together, because there is no power of intellectual thought in the compositions of Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff, with which all is connected, cemented by a literature of poetry, the, the will of the intellect. But those three, Mussorgsky, Shostakovich and Stravinsky, they stand out because of their intellectual force, immense mind power, not to mention their ingenious grassroots talent as composers. <clears throat> so let's just follow this. In Yaga, Mosuski, every few measures gives us this or that color, representing the evil. And he does it explicitly by the will of his intellectual thought. This is very easy to follow. You don't have to be a musician or a music critic or a music researcher to do this. You can just turn on your computer for the first time, listen to me talk to you, and you will understand anyway, because it's a universal human thing. It doesn't even have to do with music. It's clear and simple. Anyway, and as Baba Yaga, Musaski chooses the dullest musical intervals there is. It's really breaking into our consciousness. Seventh, <laughs> so dull. Disgusting dissonance, not without any personal attachment. There is no crescendo, there is nothing to connect with, nothing, nothing. There is simply the breaking of a hole into our skulls. First, second, a repeat crack, gap, breaking a four, and the second, breaking <laughs> in two for the second time. Namely, it's a pure <laughs> detestable aggression. Then it changes a little, the interval becomes... unfolds with the help of a small chromatic motion. But all of this is the form of blunt aggression expressed in music, the dull aggression, blunt aggression, nothing else. It's incredibly simple and tremendously effective, like in rock music. Now let's put it together. This is the evil in a pure form. The next idea. Very laconic. What is this? Maybe it's the very first superficial association. It could be something formal, something depicting the images of Baba Yaga, like her mortar and the acceleration, right? 
Somehow, I imagine she wasn't even think about it, but uh, went straight to the cultural perception of the Russian root deep vice. We see the oppression in here, right? The, the, the assault people. The shouts of Goy da, Goy da. Uh, the likes of Ivan the Terrible, Ivan the Terrible, Musk's extraordinary perception. Uh, we know all this intonation from Boris Godunov and uh, from the rest of his works. He had this incredible perception as an artist. He described the Russian evil like no one else, like no one else. This is an amazing gift, uh, another significant topic of research uh, for um, uh, psychologists and uh, psychoanalysis specialists. Let them figure out how he did it. But no one had this perception of Russian evil like Mosesky had. Anyway, he understood all of the traits of a character splendidly. And his outlook was much broader than the outlook of any other musical uh, compatriots. But even in the very barbaric episodes of Stravinsky, uh, and by the way, Stravinsky uh, depicted Russian barbarity very well, with irony, and presented it in an absolutely disgusting, hellish way, using the instrumental techniques of the 20th century. But still, still, Mosovsky's simplicity is... Well, as it, as it related to barbarity, uh, it's more effective than even the most sophisticated symphonic harmonies of Stravinsky. Because Stravinsky was looking at it from the outside, from a huge distance. He's like his namesake, Dr. Stravinsky. He had this outside knowledge of things. And uh, he's showing to us uh, the barbarity, all this barbarity uh, and all this filth, but he is doing it from the distance. From, from a different planet, as a detached observer. But here, the, we are in the very heart of evil. That is, here you can hear shouts, really, goy da goy da, that was Saprishnik was saying when they were killing people, burning houses, before they raw rape, burn before their violence. I will be frequently referring to the modern day situation and draw the parallels because a lot of evil is happening today in Russia and the evil is celebrating the same evil, not the mythological, uh, the filthy one, like the gnome, but the Maros Petrovius depicts in Baba Yaga, this one. You will see a lot of likeness. You yourself will draw the, com the, the, the comparisons and parallels. It's impossible to mention everything in one short narrative. You will listen to the music uh, later uh, yourselves and you will experience your own personal association while encountering the Russian evil. Uh, staying in the line of applying to the Russian embassy at the present time. Uh, it, it's timeless. It's ageless. Uh, it is in the trait of the nation. Uh, we can use this bad word here uh, that has greatly compromised itself in the history of the uh, many nations. Uh, so it's a nasty word in a negative sense. So the lackeys are ready to go about the business. They had moved in. There is a very unpleasant passage here. They're hollow fourth intervals. In addition, accentuated and syncopation. And again, a superficial music critic will tell something about limping Baba Yaga because one her leg is made out of bone. Like we don't know that one of her legs is made out of bone. Like we don't know she limps. But we should look into something totally different here. We should look into what the language of music is telling us. Not into some superficial mythology for children from the Goggles Night Little One Show. Good, nice Little One Show. So next, <clears throat> what we hear first is that bang. Second, Prishnik is ready to do the awful job. Anyway, uh, all this horror is coming from there. And then we're hearing the, this moment crooked, 
pisti, an incredibly aggressive. It's not enough that it's chromatic, uh, kind of a dislike. That symbolizes a reptile. But it's also a kind of reptile which is void. Resting on the void interval. It is a volumetric reptile, a live reptile plus an aggressive one. It's not just a reptilian, it's an attacking reptile, and plus it's an occupation fashion. Absolutely horrific image. Horrific, aggressive Russian reptilian. Then we hear uh, the clucking sounds. The force lugs appearing from above and uh, coming down on us. Just crushing down on us. In addition to the approach of repeal in the background, something else is crushing down as from above. And that jaws are coming together, and we are stuck in between, listening to all of this. From acoustical point of view, it is splendidly done. First, he's preparing us with the one the musical register with all the configurations of aggressive evil. That is, we are already familiar with this situation, and all of a sudden something is crashing down on us. The effect of being squeezed, and we are in between the tongues of evil. An incredible field for drama. You cannot put it differently. And next. The tongues have come together, we hear the pressure from below. It passes once, and then the next musical idea. You can't even call a musical idea, so strong is intellectual power behind it all, so strongly everything is dictated, everything is changing, every other two measures, so much meaning, so much thought, first the bone breaking, second the getting ready for the road, third squeezing us into the ring of fever, like a python is squeezing his prey, and then they finally hear the native association of this evil, which comes in dashing, raking songs. The evil becomes cynical. There are The colors of fire, like an evil flame. But here we see mockery. This is a remarkable, very simple uh, depiction of cynicism, and the choir is pouring the song in the upper voices, a dashing Russian song. But altogether it comes out that the dashing evil Absolutely stunning image that could be associated with the modern oligarchs. For instance, <laughs> Robbie Williams made a big mistake picking a non-Russian melody when he wanted to create and created a hit where he got Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet theme. And portrayed the modern oligarchs uh, and epitome of modern Russian hardship and evil. Uh, but this is a huge mistake because there is no real Russian character. There are but a neoclassical mannerism. If Robert Williams had a better understanding of music, he would have taken Modest Petrovich's theme because no one else has conveyed such true musical images and the true Russian evil. They are right here.
for Prokofiev possesses no national character, you know, only heavy aggression, most likely of European origin. Whereas here we have our dear brothers of today. <laughs> here they are, brazen, cynical. Lethally aggressive, stupidly audacious. Next musical idea is a phenomenal color. What do we have then? Ah, Moseskli presents us a pure origin of the bells. This is phenomenal philosophic idea. Pure innocent bells. Absolutely innocent bell, but here is the master of bells. No one depicted such a variety of bells in music any way you like it. Alarming, alerting, pure, small, big and bass-like, anything you like. He himself was the bell, speaking Russian epic bell. So, why bell and why such purity? Their purity isn't bellring itself. A beautiful ringing of the bell. The beautiful, almost church like the uh, bell ringing. What do we have in another voice? In other voices. Here we have A sharp, F sharp, a third. That creates such an unpleasant alarmic dissonance to the bell ringing. <laughs> Still, in, till our day, if such a, a tertiary we would be having you know, from the fire police or from police or from the ambulance. Uh, he does alarm bell, is uh, uh, timeless again. To the pure bell that it were left alone, the pure ringing of the bell, then we wouldn't understand none of that what this Petrovich tells us. But then he adds the bass bells on top of this. Very simple means. That is genius. He begins to place. Uh, look what he um, what he plays here. This is what being a genius means. By simple means, the most limited means he presented us with the dissonance of the bell. That's why the pure silver bell, when it's laid on top of dissonance, turns into uh, something that Russians like very much, something Bulgakov wrote about the apartment where the devil and his entourage live, where Mr. Voland lives, uh, the devil himself. He calls no good apartment. So to speak, this is no good bells. This is a remarkable and such a delicate artistic denotation, meaning this is of devil. All of us are so used to these epithets that they do not work for our consciousness and do not make us to look uh, at it uh, from a fresh point of view. The um, problem with the Bulgakov's phrase was that, at first sight, is very innocent description, no good apartment, but he had a great deal of hidden meanings and made us um, pay a great deal of attention to this simple epithet. Moreover, he had just to such an effect that bells are, uh, if it were cracked and sound like a wash basin, how in the world it could be achieved in such an epic portrayal? The bell in the upper voice, the middle voice, and the lower voice, but combining all three voices together, we're having the devil knows what. We get a diabolic reverberation of the leaky, cracked wash basin. 
медного дырявого треснутого таза. And what is it? Well, it's symbolizing Russia. The ringing of the bells, right? Naturally, the flight over Russia. The evil is flying over Russia. Evil flying over Russia. Something awful has happened to the soul of Russia. That's what these bells are speaking out. The bad bells are ringing over Russia. They wash space in all over Russia. I have shifted, uh, shifted the accent presently, accentuating that wash basing is thundering all over Russia. This is the image of Russia getting down to the wickedness, becoming vicious, rotten, losing your mind, wallowing in the evil. What does Matas Petrovich connect these awful sounds with after that? Then we have the mocking intonation, the upper register. He separates it with little ties. This is a sarcastic, cynical, derisive laugh. All that which we know, the most terrible Russian criminal events. I'm gonna kill you. This is the Russian inferno. But not the inferno in a fairy tale, a mythological fashion, but the inferno in the human sense of the word. The one that is aching to the eerie, horrible, frightful aspects of the Russian character, Russian psycho. Killed and loved. Let's go further. Here it is. The violence hammering down the chromatic passages. Each one of these forcible, laughing, beastly, cynical modulations coming to a blow. A British rape of the flesh, accompanied by a cynical laugh. It is absolutely timeless what Mosuski did here. He, he just cleaned off and gave a distilled essence of a Russian evil, which is absolutely timeless. No matter our days or, 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 or pre-Christian days uh, or whatsoever. It is very, really, uh, really very clear. I cannot resist myself from drawing parallels with the modern day. I know that intelligent people are watching us so they understand what's going on and the world of understanding of the horror of Russian history is sliding down to the bottom. So this modulation is always unfair, cynical mockery over something is being destroyed. This is the voice of the modern day Minister of Foreign Affairs. Some Maria Zaharova. 
You can hear it perfectly clear, this modulation not in the voice, but this is metaphysic of modern-day bureaucrats, mocking and laughing on the common sense, and then simply more of those finishing blows. Thus ends uh, the first part of this musical ugliness, and thanks God, because it's simply too unbearable, it's too much for your nerves. If you properly express it in the music, it can be damaging for the human psyche. So let's go to the middle part. Thanks God Mosesky steps away from the depiction of the active evil here, because it's simply too repulsive. <laughs> Thanks God here, we're going back to the fairy tale motives. And we can take a short break. This is of course the same very moment that we all know from our childhood. Ivan finds himself at the edge of the forest, and every one of us who imagined himself a little boy, a fairy tale, and then it's a little heart standing in the edge of the forest, and everyone's favorite saying, little heart, little heart, turn your back to the forest, and your front towards me. And basically all the middle part is about the <laughs> maneuvering little heart. And we return to the fairy tale. And of course this is masterfully depicted. Uh, if we we'll look at, uh, into it now, all this ox and ox is masterfully illustrated of the moans and groans of the forest goblins and all those associated with our minds in the fairy tales or on the landscape of fairy tales. You can have a better depiction of it. Really fantastic. You just can't do it better. You just can't do it better. All these ox, 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 and ox. All the moans and groans of forest goblins. Yeah, you see them all. Yeah. It's wonderfully done. Until our days, all the Hollywood music arrangers depict some scary ox and booze the same way in music. <laughs> Then we're still at the same age of the very same endangered forest. Mades Petrovich only adds some strokes. Some inner tremor. The atmosphere is very tense, with expectation of a possible blow from any direction. Udara. And then again, the forest goblins owing and aying. <laughs> Scary sounds of the forest. <laughs> That Mathis Petrovich depicts splendidly with all these chromatic moments. You can imagine it, right? All these goblins, all these stumps, all these stumps, that all of a sudden turn into the improbable forest personages. Like in a scary movie. It is a scary movie. This ends the middle part, um, and then we return to the same exact portrait of the aggressive film. Let's not dwell. Just move on. The same blows, uh, with only accenting shifting to depict the unpredictability of that evil. It's always changing, transforming. 
transforming evil, which is very, very important and dangerous. Unpredictability of the Russian evil is something very significant. It varies at all times, and its palette is caused suffering and incredible amens. Again, we listen to this boisterous, nasty theme. Again, the sound of wash paste. Again, the derisive laugh. The blows. Insane love on top. And it all ends with a natural disaster orgy. It seems like all is absorbed by this natural disaster. And suddenly everything explodes. Disrupts by the pure harmonies of the next piece, the final piece, the apotheosis of good, all things good, whatever it might have been. Just a remarkable contrast. The last two pieces, Modest Petrovich presents a pure good versus pure evil. A pure evil versus pure good. The confront is a remarkable dramatic effect. Bravo! Thank you very much. Tales are lies, but here is blessing. Clever follows learn a lesson. Russian saying. Let's try to remember the lesson of Modest Petrovich gave us. Bye bye, my dear friends.